Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Torch Theatre's Knowledge Exchange event. Never such innocence, what theatre lost in 2020, and perhaps we should say at least the first half of 2021 as well. My name is Professor Wes Williams. I'm a professor of French uh, here at the University of Oxford, and I'm also the director here at Torch, the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities. At Torch and through the Humanities Cultural Programme, we offer a wide range of cultural activity fueled by research. Knowledge exchange projects in particular involve collaboration and co-creation between researchers and external organizations and or public and artists. These are designed to benefit all sides of the equation, if you like. And through our knowledge exchange work with theaters and performers, we're constantly seeking new ways to enrich collaboration and co-creation and also to reflect on what it is that we're doing in these strange times. This event series is supported by the university's Knowledge Exchange Seed Fund. In future events, we'll explore online participatory projects and ask what elements of digital performance we might wish to hold on to as we move towards gathering in person once more. Today's event though was created to hear from people who have been at the front line of theatre over the past year. To introduce the event and our panel, I'll now hand over to our chair, Professor Kirsten Shepherd Barr, who should be coming on screen in a second. Kirsten is Professor of English and Theatre Studies in the Faculty of English here at the University of Oxford. Her research encompasses the interaction between theatre and science in particular, the writings of Henrik Ibsen, the relationship between modernism and theatrical performance also. Amongst her recent many publications are The Cambridge Companion to Theatre and Science, 2020, Modern Drama, A Very Short Introduction from OUP, and Theatre and Evolution from Ibsen to Beckett, published by Columbia University Press. That's all from me. Now I'd like to hand over to you, Kirsten, with many thanks for being here today. Thank you so much, Wes, and thank you. Uh, Kirsten seems to be muted. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm falling at the first hurdle. I'm, I'm apologize. Um, I was saying thank you to Wes and to Torch and especially to Ruth Moore, who has been terrific in organizing all of these seminars and putting this whole series together. Um, and over the next hour and a half, we will listen in on two pairs of speakers as they discuss the challenges of this past year. Our focus is on what theater has lost Yet no doubt there will also be much that speaks to the tremendous creative resilience we have witnessed amongst theaters and theater makers in this past year. After each pair of speakers, I will offer a brief response and we will invite you to ask your questions throughout the time um, via the Q&A function in this webinar. So do contribute questions um, when you think of things you want to ask. Uh, our first conversation is between Louise Chantal and James Baker. Louise is the joint director and artistic CEO of the Oxford Playhouse. Before joining the Playhouse in September 2014, Louise Chantal worked in professional theater for over 20 years, specializing in new writing and international work. Alongside running her own production company since 2002, varied roles include program director at Riverside Studios and Assembly Theatres, and as a producer on the London 2012 Festival and Cultural Olympiad. An Oxford graduate, she was president of OUDS and the first sabbatical university drama officer. James Saker is in his ninth year as artistic director at Royal and Durngate Northampton, during which time the theater's productions have received UK Theater, Evening Standard, The Stage and Olivier Awards. And the venue has regularly engaged over 20,000 people annually in its award-winning creative learning activities across the region. Before Royal and Durngate, he held associate director roles at the New Vic Theatre, Theatre 503 and the National Youth Theatre, and directed work for venues including Shakespeare's Globe, Manchester Royal Exchange, the National Theatre, Bath Theatre Royal, Hackney Empire, and, the, in the, and in the West End and Off-Broadway. James is a trustee of Britain's primary Black-led theatre company, Talawa, a board director of the Olympics Legacy Charity Spirit of, of 2012, and a member of the Franco-British Council's Young Leaders. Together, they will discuss the challenges to venues over the past year, 
as well as the broader theater landscape. Over to you, Louise and James, and I'll just be a little bit in the background, but you're the main act here. Thanks, Kirsten. Thank you, Kirsten. Hello, James. <laughs> Hello. Is it useful for us to dive in perhaps by talking a little bit about, uh, you know, a year into effectively uh, th this very challenging period, kind of where we are in terms of our two organisations before then zooming out a little and talking a bit more about the kind of wider state of the sector? Let's, yeah. Do you want to go first? Happily, happily. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I'm going to uh, begin really by... by um, uh, re really referring to the two phrases that were so important to Wes's introduction, which were the ethos of collaboration and uh, co-creation, because I think uh, what has got us all really through this very challenging year has been the solidarity, the care, the generosity with which um, we have collaborated both across the wider sector, but also with our communities, with our stakeholders, with our funders. And, you know, I think the thing that every regional theatre has um, been reminded of this year is that the strongest advocates for the work of a regional theatre are its audiences and its communities. And uh, now is a, a, a heartening moment because we're slowly shifting from a survival mindset to a recovery mindset and preparing to open our doors once again, all things being well, but also doing so with an ethos of building back better and focusing upon the many things we've discovered over the last year, the role that we can play in communities, the ways in which we can nurture well-being, how we can restore a sense of civic life, how we can support secondary education during a very difficult year for young people. And of course, crucially, how we can help to bring entertainment and meaning to our local communities um, as they start to rediscover storytelling and culture once more uh, after a year in which it's not been possible to, to congregate our audiences together and uh, share those stories with them. Absolutely. I mean, as we, was, we mentioned earlier, um, to uh, when we, we were having a chat that it, the title of this uh, webinar is what theatre has lost but in lots of ways and I'm being uncharacteristically positive when I say this in lots of ways we've gained quite a lot we've gained we've relearned that um, as you say that theatre is a community that the theatres the regional theatres particularly are part of our communities in a way that we thought we knew, but I really think that this year has proved that, not least by the support, the extraordinary support that the, the audience um, has shown to theatres up and down the land. I mean, both from, you know, actively saying, vocally saying they miss us, to giving us ridiculous amounts of money in terms of the, the, develop, the campaigns that we've all run to save our theatres. You know, and then they've not been huge figures in themselves. What they've been is lots and lots of 10 and five pounds from people who have been rung up to give them refunds and they've said, no, we're gonna give you that back. That just proves how, how important people think theater is. And the, you know, we've also learned, haven't we, that um, we can adapt, that our teams, our staff, our teams have been extraordinary they've reskilled they've upskilled they've learned ways of doing things that a year ago we wouldn't have even contemplated um that all the fact that i know your theater and and, and ours you know all our participation work went straight online not not you know in the autumn on march the 17th we delivered all our participation and education programs in a completely new way um, actually, quite a lot of those programmes engage with vast, vastly more groups, numbers of people than we would have done in real life. So, you know, I think there's a lot to be positive about as well, that we have learned that, that we can be adaptable and that um, people care. Louise, can I ask you to start with, um, just to start with you picking up on that point? I mean, so much activity, you've described so much activity that you've been doing 
but at the same time, there's maybe this public perception that theaters were dark, you know, nothing was happening, they just went silent. But actually, what you're describing is this hive of activity, perhaps, that was a little bit invisible to the general public. So do you think it's a surprise to people to learn that there was so much happening kind of behind the scenes? Well, it, yes, I mean, probably is. It's a bit of a shame for it's a bit of a disappointment for, to think that because obviously the other the, the people that have been working really hard throughout this whole year are our marketing and comms people. Um, we, I mean, our... Our key priority this year has been to support artists, both to survive and to do their work, to continue to tell stories, to continue to be creative all the way through. So I think most theatres threw themselves into um, finding ways to work with artists. You know, we've done hundreds and hundreds of men mentorship sessions with artists. We've done, we commissioned six brand new digital pieces. First thing, first for the Oxford Playhouse, you know, first of many, I suspect from now on, but we've, you know, we, we continue to do all our artistic development, artist development work. I feel, I mean, personally, I, you know, my hair's turned white and I've gained the Corona stone and all that. I feel that I've never worked as hard or as long hours as we have done this year, both to survive, there's been an awful lot of grant, uh, you know, funding applications to do, both to survive and to rethink how we can um, ensure the viability of both theatre, our theatre and the sector. You know, one of the things that we know uh, very well is that uh, theatre is a really, we use the word fragile, isn't it? Theatre is a really fragile, interconnected organism. And every bit of it has to work together. And so as a main, mainly receiving house, James has a, a fine producing theatre, but a mainly receiving house, you know, we have to really ensure that touring theatres, both subsidised and the commercial sector, touring producers, can get a show on the road, have enough theatres that will take a week. Uh, it's all done on a knife head financially. And one of the things we've learned this year is uh, well, the value of reserves or the lack of them, or the import of the lack of them in that, you know, it is a knife edge. We all, we both run theatres with a public subsidy of less than 10% of our turnover normally. So only it took, an, you know, the existential crisis of a, of a pandemic, to make us realize that that's not sustainable unless you, you know, you, it is busy, you have to, you have to make changes. So one of the things that we've done this year is invest in the future. We've, you know, our overheads and our running costs will be slightly smaller going forward, which always means that we can invest more in the art, in the work on the stage, in the work, in the work, in the, in the workshops and schools and support artists. What do you think, James? Do, I mean, I know you... I, no, I uh, completely agree. And uh, I think over this year, as a sector, we've learned increasingly to speak in a unified voice. And, and that as we've done so, there's been a lot of myth busting, really, about what the role of um, regional theatres is uh, and why effectively um, we, we've needed support during this period. Uh, as you say, Louise, I think a really key um, message that has started to now, um, you know, really kind of be being shared beyond our sector is the inter interdependence of the entire theatre ecology, you know, commercial and subsidised, freelance and organisation based. We are in every way, um, uh, you, you know, a, a completely kind of interconnected organism and, and one that needs all its component parts. An argument I think that I hope that early in the pandemic we were able to um, convey to politicians, stakeholders, government and so on was the substantial financial impact that regional theatres can make towards their 
local economies, but actually a more important argument has been made subsequently. And that's been the way in which theatres have really uh, realised the importance of emphasising their civic role and their potential to help restore a sense of community during this difficult time that, of course, has so eroded the ability of communities to be together. And I think we've kind of all learned in the way that we talk to our funders, our audiences, local politicians, policymakers, both that we've needed to emphasise theatre's role as a kind of economic growth engine, but also as a vital civic force, which, you know, during and after the pandemic has so much to offer, restoring a sense of community, you know, fueling local economies, local high streets, local restaurants that depend upon our, our customers for their business, nurturing well-being, working in healthcare settings, in education and community settings, and of course, more broadly or more philosophically, finding in our own small ways to bring a sense of meaning and dignity to you know our audiences lives through um putting their stories on stage and and i think it has been an kind of existential year in many ways for us because we've all had to get off the treadmill and and of course the theater sector is one that keeps itself busy uh, night to night because always the curtain has to rise at 7 30 but this past year we we haven't had that obligation and we've kind of had to ask what our value is but also how we talk about our value to our communities and, and how we depend upon them for our um, survival. And I, I think, you know, for me, what those four different areas kind of coalesce around is the central idea of um, all theatre practice, which is that it's not about buildings, it's about people. And, and ultimately, those people are custodians of the organisations that they are lucky enough to work for, whether that's a building based organisation, an independent touring company, or simply the latest production they're working on. But at the end of the day, it's always artist led. And it's always audience focused. And, and I think for all of us, our key priority over this past year has been protecting our people, by which we mean, of course, those that work for our organisations, but we also mean the young people that we have engaged since they were very young through our youth theatres, or the schools that haven't been able to deliver arts provision over the last year, or those that are working in um, uh, healthcare settings who are overstretched because of the burden of the pandemic. And, and crucially, 70% of our sector so more people than in the finance, insurance and legal uh, um, sectors combined are freelance. And that's a huge volume of people, several hundred thousand people across the live performing arts um, sector. And, and a great number of those people have fallen through the coronavirus job retention scheme and have been extremely vulnerable over this past year and there I think is a very valid argument that has been made amongst many campaigning groups on behalf of the freelance workforce that the cultural recovery fund is yet to directly support and benefit you know that huge volume of artists practitioners te technicians and so on and a key responsibility I think that weighs very heavily on the conscience of organizations like Ron Dangate, and I'm sure the same is true for you as well, Louise, um, it, it is the importance now of making work, touring work, and reigniting the sector by ensuring that the support that we've been lucky enough to have from our audiences, from government, from local authorities, now can go directly towards engaging um, the freelance workforce who are the lifeblood, of course, of our sector in every way. I mean, actually, it's proved this year's also proved exactly what you just said about theatre isn't buildings because we haven't had any buildings and we kept going. Um, you know, uh, I've always thought, you've always thought that theatre is about telling stories and we've really embraced new ways of doing that as a sector. And it's been a revelatory thing in that, you know, someone like me is, you know, absolute technophobe and, um, rather some romantic about the live experience of going to the theatre, I now, you know, I have to admit, I've never watched streamed theatre. I've loved watching some of the stuff this year. I mean, and I, and completely weirdly, I'm, I'm sitting in this room watching something and I feel like I'm there and I feel, and we get to the interval and I'm like, oh, I need a glass of wine. And mind you, that's not me. But I feel like, you know, I feel like, 
I've, I'm going through an emotional experience in a way that I didn't expect to. And I, I don't think I'm alone in that. I think the f being forced to look at theatre or art in a different way has been really good for us, actually. And we'll never just do one or the other, will we? We'll always do both now. And it's probably pushed the boundaries and accelerated the changes towards um, uh integrating digital work, integrating new ways of working. It's probably pushed that by 10, 20 years. Um, out of mother of invent, you know, necessity, mother of invention, all that. We've really, um, we've learned that actually you can still have that experience, a shared experience, even if you're not in the same space. Um, I think that, that, that that's so key as well from a regional theatre perspective C certainly in Northampton our audiences are a wonderful wide-ranging mix of old and new urban and rural liberal and conservative they're, they're a real kind of melting pot of different perspectives different interests different backgrounds and actually we've discovered that there can be different ways to reach different audiences with the same story effectively mm -hmm. uh, and that's been a hugely kind of enlightening kind of discovery about actually the way that digital can help us cultivate new audiences in new ways for whom perhaps the prospect of walking into a Victorian Proscenium March Theatre was a barrier previously yeah. but for whom after the pandemic the prospect of coming to the theatre might I hope now be be more appealing and I, I find I play constant devil's advocate with myself really over this topic of whether the digital experience is comparable to the live experience because I'm really acutely aware on a personal perspective that two of the things that I think I've struggled with most in the last year one is the sense of isolation that comes with remote working when we haven't been able to feed off the energy of collaboration being around our colleagues but also the way in which we've become attuned to engaging with the world through social media and through media platforms that are working at a very high velocity. And I think kind of in a world that, that has operated at the speed of Facebook and Twitter and uh, you know online media sources, one of the most radical things that theatre can do is slow time down. And in a world where we've all been forced to be isolated in order to protect our health, one of the most radical things that theatre can do is bring people together. And, and so I think there will always be a crucial space for the power of the live congregated communal experience. And there will also always be an argument for the value that theatre's held for millennia of kind of slowing time down, putting people in a room and encouraging them to breathe the same air with the same heartbeat and to laugh and cry and be entertained in a kind of shared moment of, of, of um, community and shared storytelling. However, I've kind of, you know, increasingly, I think, come round to the idea that what is theatre? It's engagement. It's about connecting with people. And it's possible through theatre to engage people in many different ways and to tell stories in many different ways. You, you know, you can do that in an educational setting. You can do that through digital distribution. We've also found that actually it's a great development tool for creating work in that, you know, a couple of our projects we've released this year digitally with the full intention of staging them in the future, but it's allowed our, our artists to use their audience as a kind of sounding board and to really encourage their audience to contribute towards the creative process. A, a, a really interesting example of that is a new musical that we're developing that we released as an album and we also um, released on social media platforms and we reached normal, almost 200,000 people across the world through uh, that broadcast. However, when the piece goes on to find a life on stage, it will be a completely different medium. And I'm, I'm absolutely hopeful that some of those that have downloaded that album or engaged with it on YouTube and other streaming platforms will come again, but also that it will engage a different audience in different ways. And so I think it does encourage artists to be braver and to be bolder, but also to have a conversation with their audience over time in a way that is is less ephemeral is less about that kind of 7 30 p.m moment but actually is much more reflective of the way that we connect with each other in contemporary life well, I, I wondered how whether you're making efforts to capture audience um, feedback or opinion about this future of theater i mean are you actively seeking out what do people want 
in light of this new kind of hybrid world of theater that's partly digital, partly live? Yeah, I mean, we, sorry. Um, no, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, uh, the, yes, I mean, the, the, mar the market, we do an awful lot of data mining um, after these things. What's really interesting about you know, this, the online work that we've done, if I think I can't beat 200,000, that's pretty good. But what's really good is, you know, we had nearly 5,000 people watch uh, the new commissions that we did in the autumn. Um, and the vast majority of them were new bookers to the Oxford Playhouse. So there were the vast majority of those 5,000 people were people who had not been through the doors. Uh, now, maybe it's, gonna, maybe it's a feeder drug and with a bit of luck, they will come through the doors. Frankly, I'm not too worried about that because the fact is they're engaging with the work, they're engaging with the creative ideas um, in the way that suits them. And in the way that geography is the, I've said this, but geography is the biggest uh, the barrier to access there is. We have lots of barriers to access, I know. Geography and money are the two most potent. And the fact that we can get over both those things with online work, with streaming and live streaming, is a, is, is a really exciting challenge. And it's an exciting opportunity to diversify the audience to really reach out to people who wouldn't normally think about coming to sit in a theatre in Beaumont Street um, and, and to find new stories. I just think it's, uh, it's been a year of loss in lots of ways to go back to the beginning. Um, it's certainly be, been a year of uh, genuine trauma at times, um, but it, there are huge benefits to what we've gone through and, I think the sector is more confident now, possibly more robust, but certainly more confident that theatre matters, that we matter to our audiences, that we are able to survive what was, you know, an extraordinary test in every sense, and that we are really connected um, in, in a real way to, to our audiences and particularly to our communities. And that flexibility has been such a kind of key part of the way we've had to all think this year. We, we've had to be very fleet of foot. You know, theatre has always known how to make small budgets go a very long way. And we've always been entre entrepreneurial, you know, we're a very enterprising sector, but we've had the chance this year to prototype and to test ideas in a way that we never have before but we've also I think through this um, conversation that has existed you know through platforms like Zoom with other regional theatres with our stakeholders with our audiences with local artists as we weather this storm together I think has created an appetite and a determination for change like never before. I think it's also created a bit of a danger, which is that in the kind of ecosystems that we all work within of our, our kind of sectoral conversations, sometimes we can mistake um, the difference between need and demand in the uh, on Zoom conversations. We've we probably all found ourselves talking a lot about what we think our audiences need. Indeed, I've probably done it myself over the last 20 minutes. And actually, one of the things that's going to be so key, I think, to our reopening is to really ask them directly to really, you know, hear from them through as many mechanisms as possible about what they demand of their local theatre, you know, what it is that their local theatre can do in helping to restore a sense of identity to their town and city centres again. Um, and, and so, you know, one of the losses, I think, of the last year has been what I call the kind of 7pm moment every night when I wander down from my office and I look at audiences congregating. And for me, that kind of validates why I and all of my colleagues work so hard in what we do and, and ultimately it, it, it's the energy I think that we feed off watching who is coming through the door at any given 
evening and how that kind of wonderful mix of audiences is um, engaging with us and how they're very quick to tell us what they like and what, what they don't. You know, they're who we are accountable to. And that's much harder online. I mean, it, it, obviously, digital platforms do make it easy to send a message or an email or create a kind of online forum for discussion. But what they don't really allow is that 7 p.m. moment that I think every one of us that works in a theatre so values. And one of the things I'm looking forward to enormously as we are able to welcome audiences through our doors once more is that chance to kind of be amongst a crowd re really safely socially distanced crowd but nonetheless to be able to really read the room because it is hard to read the room on zoom uh, and it is hard to kind of create democratic and open and accessible as Zoom might be it, it's hard to create that kind of palpable sense of what your audience values and what they could do without <laughs> but I mean the other thing that's happened there's so much happened this year and if we you know we use this rather glib phrase of go back better I really think that um, we will because if we are going to reflect our audiences there's been so much shift this year so much loss with the pandemic so much horror with Black Lives Matter and some really difficult questions that have been asked and I think the, the sector will go back with the view to making sure that those things and that those lessons are not lost, that we, uh, we really, I mean, there's been an awful lot of soul searching. I've sat through a heck of a lot of very uncomfortable conversations as um, a chief executive who, you know, has lots and lots of privilege. And uh, I've sat through some very difficult conversations this year um, and all that will be reflected in the way that we work from now on. You know, one of the things that um, we don't, we haven't had time to uh, sit back and think great thoughts because we've been fighting every day, we've been fighting. But what we have done is we've had thoughts about, and time, as you said, James, in the physically in the building to create new ways of sustainable working, to invest in, in little things that have made it, will make a real difference to the f um, efficiency of the theatre going forward. And that will be, that's, that, that's all really positive. Mm. And in many ways, the, the work that, you know, is yet to be done it is to ensure that those organisations that have been lucky enough to benefit from the investment of government and the support of their audiences that that funding does flow through the entire country you know to large institutions as well as grassroots arts, or, arts organizations as we've mentioned before that that now really does flow through to freelance artists who are the heart of our sector and make it what it is and also very importantly that um it, it, you know it, it flows through to proper representation of diverse artists and audiences um many of whom have been most vulnerable over the course of this this past year and and yeah. i think it's so important that really you know as we do start to think about reopening even though at the forefront of all of our minds and our board's minds and our stakeholders' minds is, of course, ongoing financial viability. Really, we have to lead with our values and we have to kind of build back, you know, with a sense of, um, you know, returning to our core principles of why, why we exist in the first place, because, um, you know, of course, financial viability is crucial. We're all businesses. And also we want to ensure that um, our, our audiences are able to it, it continue to um, it, enjoy their local theatre for generations to come, well beyond all of us kind of, uh, you know, leave our roles. But uh, non nonetheless, I think um, this kind of moment to step back over the course of this past year and that really important and, and rigorous conversations that have happened during it, I, I think, you know, have also been a wonderful reminder to all of us, to our stakeholders, um, and, and, you know, also to our, our boards and our funders and so on, of why we exist in the first place. Yeah, well, a part of the being that integrated organism is, um, it's um, a testament to the fact this is a one, one occasion when tr trickle down economics actually does work. You know, forefront of mind, I think, I'm assuming the Arts Council and DCMS with the Culture Recovery Fund um, was to keep the theatres and 
the producers going alive in order for us to be able to employ all those artists on an ongoing basis and you know as a as a small middle middle scale theatre we did we've over the past six years gone back to producing often with you James producing by stealth you know we don't have a producing budget we're a receiving house so we've had to do that from the program budget by stealth we now have four for um, a commissioning pot so we can go to artists and we can make that work and we can create opportunity for new artists and um and, and ensure as well the quality of the work on 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 us you know on the national sector in the national sector um which is really exciting and certainly um uh worth every penny worth every minute of the of the angst of the last year and in many ways one of i think both of our greatest challenges last year has been uh, as you said at the beginning of the conversation is that um it, you know subsidy only accounts for about eight nine ten percent of our business model but actually that also it, it has been um an invigorating thing to hold on to because it does mean that for every pound of subsidy invested in a venue like ours we're able to go on to then effectively spend nine pounds on supporting artists, creating work, engaging in communities. And so in our own small way, we're a kind of economic growth engine for our local theatre ecology. And, and that's a responsibility that is going to be key in the months ahead that actually, as we continue to benefit from that subsidy, we're able to really then, um, you know, amplify it, uh, you know, ninefold back into our, our lo local theatre landscape. Yeah. And I'm so sorry to cut you off, um, but we are going to be running out of time in a moment, even though this is such a brilliant conversation. Um, we probably only have time for another minute or so. Louise, you were saying something. I was just going to talk about where, I mean, what the, the, the idea of growth community, economic um, driver as well is that I'm quite sure when, when the Playhouse does open our doors on the 28th of May, you know, the, the restaurants, the bus companies, um, all those people around us will be really quite glad to see us because we do bring all those people into the city centre and animate not just our theatres, but animate the city centre, animate the space. And that's really, that's really important. And we've, we've all missed that this year. Yes, we have. This is the perfect note to end on because we can't wait to go back um into the theaters and i just want to thank you both so much louise and james for such a fascinating conversation and what really strikes me i'm actually really moved by the way you described so positively what really might have been and possibly is of course a devastating situation for people's livelihoods for our experience of theater but you've been so agile in the thing the flexibility that's coming across and how you adapted instantly and so much that we didn't see going on to make that happen is, is just extraordinary. And the way you talk about embracing the challenges thrown up by this pandemic to the theaters, to the broader industry, it's really lucid and realistic, but also extremely, it's forward looking and positive. And really, really exciting to hear you describe it in this very individual, but also sort of broader way, always an eye to kind of that broader landscape of the industry. And please stay, stay um, to ask Louise and James any questions. I hope you'll all, um, I'm speaking to the audience now, uh, send us questions. The um, qu question and answer session will be after the next panel. So I'll, I'll just politely and not dramatically ask James and Louise to exit. And uh, thank you so much to you both. And we'll turn to the next panel. Thank you. So our second conversation is between Arifa Akbar and Ellie Keel. Arifa is the Guardian's chief theater critic. She is the former literary editor of The Independent, where she also worked as arts correspondent and news reporter. She has previously contributed to The Observer and The Financial Times. She's on the board of trustees for the Orwell Foundation in English 10. Her first book, Consumed, A Sister's Story, is a memoir of sisterhood, illness, Art and tuberculosis. Ellie is the founder of Ellie Keel Productions, and her producing credits include the sellout shows Potter and Fisher by Mary Higgins and L. Potter, Soho Theatre, Collapsible by Margaret Perry, Vault Festival and Elsewhere, 
Annabella Ima by Lisa Demore, Arcola Theater, and Redefining Juliet at the Barbican Center. In October 2019, Ellie founded the Women's Prize for Playwriting. The prize is co-produced by EKP and Payne's Plow in association with Sonia Friedman Productions. And together they will discuss their particular low and some high points over the pandemic and some of the lessons learned. Over to you, Aretha and Ellie. So thanks, Kirsten, for that. And um, let's get to it, Ellie, because um, just as a starting point, you know, I followed your work as a producer um, and I've been following it in this past pandemic year. But just so everybody knows the context, you know, what were you, I want to ask you what you were doing um, when the pandemic brought so much to a halt. Uh, where were you? What were you doing? Um, well, I was actually up in Edinburgh touring Hotter to the Traverse um, the week bef before the pandemic hit. And I remember sitting in the audience there uh, thinking or, or perhaps even knowing that it, it was the end of live performance for, for quite some time. I'd, I had no idea that it would be as long as it is in fact has been. Um, but that was a tremendously bittersweet moment, um, sort of being surrounded by um, people enjoying the show and, and feeling that it was the end of something. Um, so that tour had to stop. Um, Collapsible, which was playing at the Bush Theatre in London, which I was producing, had to stop. Um, in fact, only a week before the end of its run, thankfully, but the sales had dropped off a cliff as people lost confidence in going out. But what more positively, what had happened just before the pandemic was that submissions had just closed for the Women's Prize for Playwriting. So I had an absolutely bursting inbox of nearly 1,200 plays that I knew we had to process, many more than I had thought that we would receive. So in a, in a way, and not that I really thought this at the time, but with the benefit of hindsight, looking back, I'm thinking, well, actually <laughs> the opening up of a bit more time probably wasn't the worst thing that could have happened at that point. So, so there was the shutting down, but then there was also this big project that I knew I had to embark on and, and give a lot of time to. Yeah. What, about, what about you, Arifa? Well, I, was, I, want, I want to pick up on the Women's Prize, uh, Prize for Playwriting, because of course uh, I followed that and I, I talked to you about it and, and it's pretty phenomenal that you did that in a year where everything was closed so and got such luminaries involved. But, but before I ask you that, um, what was I doing? I was, ha having been a journalist and critic, you know, for, for decades, um, I'd recently switched roles and I joined The Guardian as a full-time chief theatre critic, um, Michael, Bill a job that Michael Billington had done for nearly as long as I've been alive. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, so there was excitement around that, but, you know, nearly two and a half months later, that job, becomes potentially redundant yeah. and you know on the 16th I remember going to the National Theatre and being absolutely elated by a seven hour production um seven, seven streams of River Ota by by Lepage uh, sitting there for seven hours enthralled and then the following week I went to the Watermill Theatre beautiful theatre in Newbury and and um realized as I was going in actually that everything was going to be shutting down and it didn't feel real as I'm sure, you know, it was sort of a sense of disbelief that probably swept across the, the entire um, world <laughs> and, and especially the theatre industry. So there was that strangeness after that evening thinking, what now for my shiny new job? And actually what now for theatre criticism? Mm. And over the next few, well, weeks, I would say, um, I know that myself and, and several other critics at, at various newspapers sat perplexed, scratching our heads, thinking, are we going to be working at all? How do we adapt if there's absolutely nothing, if theatres have gone dark? Mm. Um, and and I, I, the biggest surprise for me, really, because I, I emailed my, you know, the Guardian saying, well, perhaps I should step down now and then step back up when theatre resumes, because I couldn't think what I could be doing if I was the chief theatre critic and theatre wasn't happening. But the biggest surprise um, 
was that theatre did happen and it was happening. And the first uh, sort of wave of online theatre was largely archival. So it was shows that had been filmed already and there were people rushed to put them on. And there was the empty live shows that were very high end. But, mm -hmm. but you know, regional theatres, theatres theatre across the board just thought on their feet, you know, and um, but but it was the archival stuff that was hitting us critics and we started reviewing and then you got the sort of far quicker response monologues and then the invention around online theatre and I'll, I'll talk a bit about that later but you know it goes from everything from you know monologues quick response monologues after the Black Lives Matter stuff and and actually quick response um, plays around the pandemic pandemic as a theme itself to telephone theatre to promenade outdoors theatre when we had those interim sessions where we could mm -hmm. meet out to you know uh, audio and I know you did lots of audio so I found myself being a theatre critic mm -hmm. but crit you know the criticism was now engaging in this the hybridities around the form so so it required some new skills some old but theatre was still happening you know I still I still felt useful. Did it and, change the way that you that you wrote about it or did it well first of all your thoughts and then what you wrote I mean well firstly I had I wasn't it wasn't the same form really because theatre as I've known it until now really has been live. It's been there, physically there before you. Mm -hmm. And it felt both exciting and a little bit unfair on the theatre to be judging it because you had to, this was a new thing for theatres as well as for viewers, as well as for the audience. And it, and, and it felt, I felt that it was amazing that theatre had, had done this. And also uh, um, it, it, it was, unfair to judge the you know online theater in this with the same measure with the same measuring stick because firstly theater makers are not filmmakers you know and i think that that it's a tall order to get louise talked about reskilling upskilling phenomenal you know the theater uh, industry has shown that it can but i also think it's a really tall order and it's slightly unfair to ask theaters to become film producers but um i could go on and on about that but i i, I suppose i want to ask you and I've, I've, I've offered up some of this myself but what were the ways that you adapted your work to survive you know both your work as a as a producer but also the 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 playwriting prize so how to, how were did those things had to, how, how did they change for you to be able to continue to do what you were doing if you could? Mm. Well, it re particularly at the start, it, it, I did feel that it was a case of survival. Um, I, I'd been working in March, 2020, I'd been working for about seven years and a lot of the people I worked alongside or who I employed were similarly quite early on in their careers and really the the precarity that was introduced into their lives by the pandemic was was so disarming and yeah. really you felt that you you either sort of innovated to survive or 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 you just gave up i mean i know that sounds dramatic but but that that was the sense at the time um and one of the hardest things wasn't actually absorbing the, the news and the ongoing developments myself, but communicating them to other people who were working for me or with me and saying, well, this isn't happening. And what this means is X and this is what you will be paid instead. And sometimes, you know, sometimes nothing, unfortunately. And so what I urgently wanted to do was find a way to keep people working um, and to do that in the most kind of... Um, economically sensible way possible um and so I thought well I've always really loved radio plays and radio drama I've actually always wanted to make one but just never quite had the motivation all the time um so I jumped into a big co-production with another young theatre company 45 North called Written on the Waves which was a series of eight uh, audio dramas all by different writers some who I'd worked with extensively in the past and and also lots of new ones um, and that enabled us to work 
ultimately with over a hundred young and and not young actually creatives um up up until now we're, we're just finishing off the productions now um and that's been really gratifying because it has been keeping people in work and it has been a really egalitarian way of doing it because it doesn't you know you don't have to be in london and you don't have to go out we can record from home if necessary we often go into a studio but and what I, because I know about this series because I reviewed one of them, but what I noticed and what I thought was clever was that you teamed up, um, you, you'd, you'd sort of combined teams in a very interesting way. So you, I did, I saw that, that a lot of the writers were up and coming and new writers, but then you got these sort of quite starry names involved. Will you, will you tell, uh, was that a strategic move or how did that evolve? Because you, you, you had great actors. Uh, yeah. I think it was strategic. Um, I felt that there was there was a proliferation of online and digital work, as, as you've referenced, um, and I wanted to you, use casting as a way to stand out, I suppose, because, you know, we, we all know that um, starry casting can help sell tickets. Um, uh, but also I thought how nice, you know, that, that these brilliant actors, you know, Sharon D. Clark, Catherine Parkinson, Olivia Williams, and so on, it, they're not as busy as they normally are. How great to pair them up with someone who, who, who hasn't written extensively before and has this chance. And it was great, you know, it was, it was a real like meeting of minds. And um, I found those actors incredibly generous and receptive and willing to get involved. Um, yeah, no, it was fantastic. Mm. Mm. Um, and so, so with so, so you adapted with the with the sort of um, oral stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what about how did you adapt so that the prize might progress? Because you know, mm -hmm. was, was it stalled because theatres weren't weren't uh, theatre wasn't happening? You know, how how did you make that prize happen? The inaugural year. Um, well, we tried to stick to the plan, which had been to uh, process all the submissions over the summer and for the judging panel to meet in the autumn. And we more or less did that. We ended up sort of postponing by perhaps a couple of months because people were on furlough and it, it, people's circumstances did inevitably change. And that meant we had to take things a bit more slowly. And, you know, my own work had changed and I had to do more of certain things and a bit less of running the prize from time to time so so we stuck with it and the the judges met I think in October and we awarded um as you know um two first prizes in December um and we were we were really lucky because we got um a very big grant halfway through the year from Ian McKellen's birthday show which was possibly a highlight of the pandemic actually that 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 immense act of generosity came at a time of such peril. Frankly. You also you also got Sonia Friedman sort of involved as well. Do you think yeah. these moves were as a result of the pandemic, you know, if the pandemic have a, has a silver lining for a producer, do, do you feel that people were listening more, available a little more, um, uh, maybe yeah. open to a prize like this in its first year in a way they might not have been. I know it's very hard because we're now speculating, but do you feel there was an element of that? I do, yes. I think that the pandemic has has driven some people to extremes. I think for some people it's meant a curtailing of generosity, but for many more, in my personal experience, it has increased receptivity and and generosity. Um, and I've been lucky to have that experience, I think, but I think that there was a collective drawing together to ensure that we, as an industry, survive. As I say, that's been my personal experience, and I'm, there are exceptions, but uh, what's been your silver lining, Aretha? Well, um, <laughs> silver linings are hard. So, so silver linings are... Um, I think that there, there, had, there have been lessons for me. I'm, I wonder if I'd call them silver linings, but <laughs> um, there have been less. Well, first of all, I think the pandemic gave me time, mm. both, both as a theatre critic, and you know, for, for many years I'd been a 
book critic and a, and a critic of many things, but, but largely literary critic. This gave me time to adjust to a, a different way of working with different deadlines um, and a different, slightly different sensibility. So, so it gave me time to adjust in a way that the job would have been fast and furious. So that's really just on a technical level for me as a, as a new you know, chief critic. I think more generally, it gave me um, a pause for thought. And I think it did this for the entire industry. So I felt myself, I felt, I was asking questions such as, so what is theatre? Because online theatre was happening along with all these offshoots of, you know, um, dramatists writing much more sort of audio stuff and the telephone stuff that I've mentioned. And it actually made me think, you know, what is theatre? If it can be on screen and, you know, what is it then? Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, what constitutes this theatrical experience? What do we want it to be? Uh, who is theatre for then? Who do we want it to be for? All of these questions popped up because of what was happening out in the world. Uh, what about access in theatre? All of these questions that I may not have got round to asking myself in quite a penetrating way, that theatre itself was asking in some of the shows that I was seeing. Um, it, I think theatre became much more self-reflective and, and as a result, I found myself engaging with those things and you know the ideal of what theatre could be what we what I might hope for it to be when when it when things open up again so a sort of important pause for thought it also um allowed me I think to engage with the industry in a way that I probably wouldn't have had time as a critic so I found myself you know adapting as well like you I, I wrote a lot more beyond uh, uh, just reviews I was I was writing I was talking to, to actors, producers, um, directors, um, about the things that they were producing, but also about uh, their worries, their hopes, you know, and I'm talking across the board from Rup um, Rufus Norris, talking about how desperately at the beginning, the government needs to help the sector to artistic um, directors across the regional theatre to writing a diary around the Watermill Theatre in the first eight weeks of how they were how they were surviving just the sort of intim intimate sort of details of how that artistic writer that specific theatre was struggling to survive and surviving and being so imaginative in in in, in that in surviving I love um, that diary um for yeah, anyone watching it's really worth looking it up it, it's and it was so popular it was so emotional you know I was phoning the artistic director there Paul Hart every week and I was close to tears and you know I didn't let him hear that but um the strength and imagination that it, you know in in keeping that theatre uh you know and, and this is a, it, keeping it alive and and I think this is an important point where I think it's been um, really hard for those theatres that have decided not to have online output because it doesn't mean that they're not trying to survive and surviving. And even mothballing, you know, it, it, it still re requires a lot of people to keep working. And um, so, so I felt while it was pretty amazing to be reviewing the, sh you know, for these theatres to do heroic stuff and put and have in have having creative output and and the amazing stuff that for example something like the Lawrence Batley Theatre did with Henry um Philo Bennett he he sort of created a hybrid form of theatre and he 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 got lots of regional theatres to gang up and create this sort of almost Netflix type screen theatre very original stuff mm. for, for all of the the incredible creativity and, and resource put into that. I really feel for theatres who who weren't putting up, but were, were sitting down and thinking, okay, let's do let's plan what we do when we when we are allowed to open, or let's just plan how we get through this without this theatre closing down. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it was all about content. You know, it was. Um, I'm slightly getting away from your question about silver linings, but but um, I think it's important to say that about about venues. Yeah. Um, and have you have you noticed a shift in the um, preoccupations and themes of the shows that you've been uh, reviewing? What 
across all across all media because of course there was a time in in the middle of last summer when a few shows were were open and, and yeah and five. you know we we talked a little bit about um the black lives matter movement uh which which really entered uh the world of of quick response theater and i was seeing a lot of short plays a lot of monologues around race injustice i was also seeing you know bigger productions spike lee's um play passover that was filmed at the steppenwolf uh theater was brought at, you know amazon prime put that out suddenly it had this immense resonance after george floyd's um we can now say murder um and and i reviewed that and you know the whole what what I what I do think is 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 amazing with what we've learned about online theatre is that it can respond in a way that that a live production and with a timing that a live production maybe can't do. Mm. It can mobilise, you know, in in days rather than weeks, and it, it is a very it still requires resource and time. And you know, as you say, you've got to try and pay pay the people involved, and and I think equity is trying hard to manage that because online theatre for some was you know last May March was when people made some of their first productions, and and I don't think that you know there weren't rules around paying and time, and everybody seemed to muck in because it was about you know showing it was about a heroic you know gestures and trying to keep the industry going and trying to keep the freelancers you know working but it's not about that anymore it's about pay it's about uh, possibly a parallel sort of uh, form of theater coexisting probably possibly i don't know it'd be interesting to see where things go um but but in terms of themes that there have been you know there's been a lot of uh, themes that focus on the pandemic itself yeah. and are still doing that about connection about isolation do you feel that your written on the waves uh, uh series had some of those themes in um i do yes and i also feel that a, a, a lot of the pieces also reacted very strongly against that and okay um, perhaps wrote pieces um that, that wanted to revel in sort of togetherness and um you know crowd scenes and things like that i, mean, I kept noticing perhaps i just noticed them more because we we don't have them at the moment um so yeah and and what we've got we've got a few more minutes before we hand back over uh, to the group and i just wanted to ask you this that you know you you've put out the 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 you've done amazingly with the with the prize um you you've kind of um adapted to survive but what what now what are your hopes for yourself hopes and plans and also for the in industry at large you know but yeah hopes hopes and dreams <laughs> well on a on a personal level i'm just i'm diving back into live work um with with a full heart really um we as i mentioned we had two first prize winners from the women's prize last year and we're producing both of them live uh this this summer so reasons you shouldn't love me opens at the kiln theatre next month uh, and went into rehearsal on monday and i cannot tell you the joy of going to that first day of rehearsal and being being in a room with 18 or so people who've pulled it together um and I can't reveal what we're doing with the other one yet but it's very exciting um uh and perhaps I can say that it's happening in Scotland um and yeah I'm just going I'm going back to that and I'm doing two two weeks of a, a big double bill uh, at Soho Theatre and I wouldn't say I'm not fussy about what I do that's live, but I I just want to get back to it and um, re rejuvenate, really. Um, and in terms of the whole sector, I, I hope that we don't regress to uh, perhaps conservative programming. Um, I hope that, you know, we can push the prizes mission of equality in the, in the number of plays by written by women on major stages. Um, and I think we do, as as James and Louise both said, we we have to uh, keep honouring those freelancers and keep um, employing them because 
there's no doubt about it that we have borne the brunt financially of this pandemic, I believe. Um, and back at you, what, what, what are your... Well, I, uh, I completely uh, want to echo what you just said about, um, I hope that theatre, you know, as an industry doesn't seek recourse in, in the safer productions, the, the seats on, the bums on seats sort of, you know, box yeah. office hits. I hope it, I hope theatre decides um, to, to be bold and to experiment and to not think that people are going to be put off by that. Mm -hmm. um, I hope we've learned some of the lessons around access, yeah. um, around the building itself, who it allows in, who it intimidates, who has been, you know, the, 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 maybe the new demographic that has watched online theatre and thought, oh, well, maybe theatre is for me. Yeah. yeah. Maybe it's not just for that echelon, but may, maybe I am allowed to, to be part of it. So I hope, you know, theatre embraces that and encourages that access, encourages that the some of the, you know, mm. democracies that, that online theatre has introduced. Uh, for me personally, I've got a diary, astonishing, that's filling up with live, you know, sometimes parallel, both online and live performance, it coming back in May. And I, I'm thrilling at it. I'll never take it for granted as a job again, you know, because... Nor I will I. <laughs> yeah, but, and I think it's that just the raw excitement of, of being um, part of a collective experience. Sitting there and watching something in the dark together is will never be so powerful again and I remember after that long first lockdown I went to the bridge to see a David Hare play and and you know I whether whatever I thought of it you know and review, however I reviewed it I became incredibly emotional when, when the first wave of laughter happened and it was just hearing everybody people laughing together mm -hmm. you know that the power of that collective experience um was overwhelming at that point and I think it will be again and my hope my last hope I suppose is um that I keep up you know I really liked the fact that for me as a critic theatre became sort of global it you know I, I started reviewing Steppenwolf stuff and other American stuff I reviewed European theatre Belarus Free Theatre put something out and I reviewed it and it became a, a, a sort of a job that, that and it was very interesting to offer that to Guardian readers and to readers in general and and to be part of that bigger theatre conversation. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I have high hopes. Uh, but but for now, um, shall we <laughs> hand back? Shall we hand back to Kirsten and and um, and have the Q and A? Yes, that's great. Thank you so much for this terrifically insightful conversation of it, just, just laying so much bare and speaking so candidly about what you've been going through. Um, and, and such an interesting pairing with um, the two perspectives you bring to, to, this, to this conversation. Um, thank you, thank you to you both. And in fact, I think we're throwing it open now to questions um, from everybody. I do have a couple coming in, lots coming in from the audience actually. Um, and I, I wanted to actually, uh, start with a question from Professor Ballister, who asks, um, as someone, actually, she, she has worked with uh, with theaters, including um, Royal and Durngate, and so she's coming from a position as an academic, and she says, your theaters both have connections to higher education academic institutions, Oxford University and the University of Northampton, um, and she's speaking to James and uh, Louise here specifically. Has the online experience made it possible or at all helpful to have new opportunities or have new opportunities arisen in these connections with academic researchers and student drama? So I'm starting off with this particular question because we are in a university setting and it just makes a lot of sense, especially given also Ellie's background um, here as well. So I'm throwing that one open. It looks like it's mainly um, to start with perhaps Louise or James. Right, would you like to start? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, again, it was one of those uh, situations of um, necessity was the mother of invention. I think um, we um, we have a really close relationship with with a lot of departments in the university. One of the things that I 
really relish actually about the Playhouse is that we don't just work with the English literature department. You know, we, we we've got really good connections with maths, modern languages, classics. It's it's a really rich uh, relationship, and um, we have continued to do that through the pandemic. Not, I mean, not huge. Yeah, you know, not in huge numbers. But it, I think what I one of the things I've learned this year is that you know it, you can make a difference in the micro. It might just be one thesis you help or one um, uh, script that you help uh, you, you dramaturg, but it's it's actually a, a new opportunity for to work. One of the things that we were really ex surprised about was how many students um, submitted new plays to our community playmaker um, program because right at the beginning I can barely remember the beginning but right at the beginning um, we we have a, a lifelong writing program uh, called playmaker and it starts with primary playmaker and young and then professional playwrights and um, we uh, we opened it up to the community and we got 60 I think we got 60 um, scripts submitted from people we really not known or worked with before. All the plays were read, all the plays were uh, reported on. And quite several, you know, a good chunk of those were from student writers. Um, we would not have actually had that opportunity to, to work with students in that way. And I'm thinking now of how we can build that into how we work with, with um, the students at university, both universities um, in the future. Um, in terms of research, I've not personally had a connection. I know that our, our participation team have been working with all sorts of people at Torch as well. Mm -hmm. Sorry, James, what, do you, what have you... Well, really, really similar perspectives. Um, and I think probably the focus is where it's been possible this year has mostly been on vocational training opportunities. Uh, of course, education has allowed us to do things indoors that haven't been possible within the guidelines for professional theatre. We've been very fortunate in that we've hosted the National Youth Theatre as, as the beginning of a three-year partnership over the last six months and that's meant that we've had um, this kind of wealth of young voices continuing to train and to collaborate under our roof and indeed our first two productions next month will be um, uh, giving those young people their professional debut, which is going to be a very uh, kind of exciting, rejuvenating way of kind of uh, starting our, our year. Uh, it, it's been interesting. I, I, my flat is very close to the university campus. And so when I've walked into work every day, I've walked through the student halls at Northampton University and, um, you know, ultimately seen uh, through the windows of them, lots of students doing everything by Zoom. And it's a very international university, uh, Northampton's, and it has felt very difficult, I think, this idea that people have traveled from all over the country and all over the world to come and study in our town. And we haven't yet been able to welcome them through the doors of our theatre. There are some ways we've started to reanimate the venue by hosting socially distanced lectures and so on, but most of it has been on Zoom. And so um, in terms of ease of access, we've kind of found that where we do do um, partnership activity with uh, local universities, that we've probably attracted more people to masterclasses and workshops and seminars than ever before, because of course Zoom does open up that kind of access. But what we haven't really been able to do is to welcome them um, to their local theatre and hopefully to establish the idea that it's a space for them, not, not just to come and see work or to participate in creative activity, but just a social space for them as well. And a space where you know our public spaces become a key part of their experience of um, living and working in the town centre for a few years. So there's definitely been advantages and, and I, I think probably our partnership activity has served probably more of a purpose than it ever has before, whether that's been through our um, collaborations with Oxford or, or, or Birkbeck or Northampton University or, or indeed with secondary education with all of the local colleges and, and with vocational training like our partnership with the National Youth Theatre but I think what we're really looking forward to is being able to take all of that goodwill and impetus and actually hopefully welcome a lot of those young voices back to the theatre. And also to think about how, 
in terms of building for the future, their voices can can be at the front and the centre of our discussions. I mean, we, we touched a little bit upon some considerations around environmental impact earlier, and we've really found that in Northampton, some of the leading voices about the way that the cultural industries can be better environmentally have been students and young people, and, and they've brought such passion and expertise to that dialogue that, that I think it's so crucial that, that we don't lose that as we think about um, you know, a return to normality or a version of normality. Hmm. Marie, um, you... Can I just add though, that in the way that we've adapted, I think the students have really been extraordinary this year. Um, as Ellie knows all too well as a, uni as a former university drama officer, uh, he was standing in the foyer on my very first day at the Oxford Playhouse. Um, uh, we, we normally have two um, student shows in the Burton Taylor studio every night during term time and um, obviously for the last year we've not been able to do that and the students have really uh, amazed me by their um, you know their entrepreneurial zeal to to be doing things online to be doing things a different way they've been when we were able to have socially distanced uh, rehearsals in the BT during the um, autumn term. We, you know, there, there was a really good uh, schedule of people going in to work socially distanced, to film, to do all sorts of things um, to get over this problem. We, at the moment, we're hosting the Greek play um, on our website. We, normally, we host it live every three years, but we're, they've, we've, they've recorded it this year, filmed it brilliantly, and we're disseminating it um, with the university. It's, you know, we've all worked together as, as we've all, you know, as I say, collaboration is the name of the day to make it work, and students have been a real part of that. Wonderful. I'm, I'm going to leap to the next question unless, is that okay with everybody? There are loads coming in. Um, so we have a, a question about what are the panelists' understandings of how small touring theatre companies have and are managing through this time? Small touring theatre companies have been mentioned as another tier in the theatre ecology, but more has been said about the building-based theatres and the freelancers than the small-scale touring theatre companies. How will they emerge from the lockdowns? Does anybody want to plunge in on that? Um, I I would just pick up on something. That I, I wouldn't necessarily separate small scale touring theatre companies and freelancers necessarily, because I think that a lot of small scale touring theatre companies comprise freelancers. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, uh, that personally, um, well, I've, I've been surprised that um, I've been asked about touring shows um, of mine by, by theatres um, and asked sort of when we're getting back on the road so I've sort of been pleasantly surprised by that. Um, I I think that to, to state the obvious touring, touring is hard in Covid times because of all the protocols that you have to uh, bear in mind and um, implement and that they can be very expensive and touring as Louise and James will will know can be hard to um Fuck up. yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes um so I think it's almost so it's it's the same but more extreme as making other kinds of theatre in um in that it is going to be pre precarious for a mm. while and I think people perhaps actors will and other creative team members will be a bit more reluctant to commit to long tours and things like that. I don't, perhaps I'm wrong. What, what do you think, Louise and James? Um, in the absence of a crystal ball, um, I'm not like, completely sure. Um, I think all actors will desperately, I think all creators will desperately want to get back to work. And I think yeah. that involves touring. Um, how they the, the logistics of it are going to be grim and we've been thinking about this you know in this week we've been working out how on earth we're going to bobble a panto company and we will we'll have to you know normally we send them out on digs in digs and this year we'll be sorting out houses and putting them all together um it's a very different way of working um but again without wanting to be pollyanna-ish um I think we've proved, haven't we? Oh, we've lost James. I think we've proved that we can adapt, that we will, you know, it, these are, these are 
what we used to have a wonderful person stay on the staff who called it problems uh, a solution opportunity it would be yeah a <laughs> yeah and we might even end up in a in a better place and make touring more congenial to actors and creative teams well it? i mean if we could get away from theatrical digs the more the merrier you know the sooner the better to be honest yeah 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 we're all concerned. Um, can i pick up on something on that maybe arifa could speak to first which is a question here from someone noting that there seem to be two conflicting narratives one that the pandemic provided a valuable moment of reflection two that this was a period of frantic activity and the question is, which do you think predominated in your own experience? Um, I, 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 I think both things had to happen. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the answer I prefer to give is that there was important reflection and, and theatre companies had time for that reflection. But I, I'm also really mindful of the fact that theatres were trying to survive and they had to find ways to survive. And that was frantic for a lot of theatres mm -hmm. um, and the theatres that didn't receive funding, you know, particularly. Um, and and that, that frantic action was either around, you know, business plans and trying to find ways of not crashing, um, but also changing their programming with every lockdown and with every hope raised and then quashed you know because that's what happened last year that's the reality of what happened that that meant that everybody had to reconvene for the for plan b c d etc and that did lead to frantic rethinking so so that was definitely happening and i think in parallel i don't think that it was an either or you you know you sit back and you either have the time to to reflect the you know the indulgence of reflecting or your headless chicken and you really got to do, you can't have no time to think. And you, I think the frantic action required deep thinking. Mm. It's almost like, you know, some people were being forced to rethink the system. Who are we making theatre for? All of those questions that I, that I you know, mentioned earlier, um, they had to answer those deep questions in order to frantically remake things and remodel things so one fed the other I think this is partly what was so if there is a silver lining you know the sort of regenerative aspects of mm. theatre uh, questioning itself um, but also the test the test of theatre that had to do both those things and I mm. think that that's quite unfair to ask an industry to quickly reinvent or adjust as it thinks through quite deep problems, systemic problems, which again were brought out partly out of the pandemic. You know, how do we find a business model to survive this? Unless we think that this is a one-off in a lifetime is never happening again. How do we now plan for this? You know, whether it's parallel online and live, or, you know, what, how do we plan for it in the future? To, as well as, um, Black Lives Matter highlighting, it didn't invent anything Black Lives Matter, that movement, um, it actually just highlighted that theatre is extremely elite, extremely white, and it has, there's a massive problem, immense problem that theatre, I think, has pretended to solve or tried to and failed, and now it must address, and there are some theatres that are having to take that, are taking it very seriously, you know, with programmes that the Royal Court and the Young Vicar just entered into a consultation around systemic racism within their own venues and that that doesn't mean that the Royal Court and the Young Vic hasn't been also putting out its program and creating a program through the pandemic it has the Royal Court has done has filmed you know its living newspaper its project and the Young Vic has also been doing projects alongside this deep thinking yeah Anybody want to add to that? Well, I just think exactly, I mean, I agree with everything that Arifa said in that exactly. The, the sheer number of times we've had to look at how are we going to survive and write those, those funding applications and write the business plans and actually question everything about what went before. And the, at the heart of those questions is who, who are we for? Who are we serving? And when I 
it, that, those two those two things of being reflective and frantic are not mutually exclusive in any way. The day to day management, the challenge, the getting everything done, the you know in our case the becoming a lecture hall for the university, you know all those things have been absolutely full on twelve hour days um, for whole team um you know nearly everyone at some point or other in our team have been furloughed but very few have been furloughed at all all the way well in fact no one's been furloughed all the way through we've all been working and then the 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 fact that it was uh, an opportunity to, to reflect was a corollary of that all that work created questions created an opportunity to go that doesn't work does it let's do so different next time so it's it's yeah. So we, we actually have this terrific stream of questions coming in. So i I'm going to uh, leap ahead and um, I've got one here saying, thinking back to James's point about the public's need and demand, I'm wondering how far you think we'll see theater that's explicitly about COVID-19 in the near future. Do you think audiences will want or be ready to sit down together and reflect on the experience via theater? Or will there need to be a period of putting it behind us for a while before that can happen? Not sure who wants to talk about that one. <laughs> um, I, I have something to say, which is um, that before the pandemic, I had just commissioned um, Simon Stevens and Ruby Thomas to write a new play. Um, and we had talked, this was perhaps eight or 10 months before coronavirus or, or even longer and we talked about what it might be about and lots of different ideas and kind of st stimuli and everything and what landed in my inbox in uh, January was a play set over a single day in April 2020 in London uh, with 10 characters and the, how their lives had been affected by the pandemic and I have to admit that when I when I sort of read the outline my heart sank slightly o only only because i i thought i I've, I've had enough i can't i can't visit this this topic in fiction yet um but actually to be honest i think we are going to see these plays and i and i don't resent them and i don't dread them because i think this is a mo the theater responds to our collective experience and, and has to speak to it and has to grapple with it and there has been a lot of trauma and a lot of change and it would be unnatural to just move on uh, and pretend it hasn't happened in in my own view and I think it just has to be that theatre has to be made responsibly and sensitively and with an understanding that audiences are going to be sitting down having had very different and sometimes to use the word again, traumatic experiences and need to be looked after as much as possible. I mean, if theatre is uh, part of reflecting and um, evaluating our world, we have a we almost have a political responsibility to be asking those questions as soon as possible uh, and to be voicing really important questions about people's experience and what what went wrong and all sorts of things like that so I think it's gonna happen yeah and, and I also I also think it'll happen but I think it'll happen in some perhaps kind of quite metaphorical ways rather than literal so mm. we've had quite a lot of literal responses to the pandemic you know we have had monologue plays about what it means to be locked locked in you know alone in 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 indoors um, uh, isolated, you know, uh, and uh, and also virtual dating. What it means for us to connect, to fall in love, to be to be part of the bigger world. So we've had those very, um, you know, step by step sort of. This is what it feels like to be in a pandemic. Sort of um, product imaginative uh, performances. But I think I think we'll get something a little more different, perhaps reflections on a on a bigger societal level or philosophical level about what it means to be a community um, mm -hmm. that has had this level of to use Ellie, Ellie's word trauma or to um, to, to to be isolate to be a, a society in a world that has experienced isolation and, and is reconvening a sense of slightly starting over 
you know, maybe a, a utopian element as well as the dystopia we've just been through. So, so, so the pandemic and its bigger questions that it set, that it sparked, rather than here's how lonely it was and here's a monologue of how miserable I was, you know. So, so we've reached two, two o'clock and I just need to say um, that I need to let the audience know that obviously you can leave if, if you need to, but we will stay, if that's all right with all the panelists for another five minutes or so because of um, the, the backlog of questions. Um, sorry to interrupt, do, do pick up um, if any of you wanted to keep responding to that particular question. I think um, uh, just, just to add that, of course, alongside the um, uh, pandemic and this terrible year, um, there's also been another kind of revolution in the way that we think about uh, the stories that we share and consume, which is the kind of digital revolution we've seen um, through streaming services, through the growth of Netflix, HBO, Amazon, Disney, and so on. And, and one of the things that has kind of been an extraordinary part of that um, movement is the way that um, more specific niche um, stories have taken on huge popular appeal and have really challenged received wisdom about what is popular. You know, some of the most popular um, series on TV have been in languages other than English, or they've been set in parts of the world that none of us have vid visited, or in uh, communities that we might not previously have thought we have shared affinities with. And, and I do think that's been a huge game changer for our sector as we go back to thinking about what constitutes popular and what constitutes relevant. Now, inevitably, uh, you know, the the pandemic has been one of those big universal all encompassing things that's affected everyone in this country. It's one of those rare things that has. And so in our attempts to be relevant, we're going to be touching upon themes that have surfaced either directly or indirectly as a result of the pandemic. But I also think that in, in thinking about contemporaneity and um, asking, you know, as we do, why Northampton? Why now? Why our audience? As we ask with every commission we make, I think we also need to all, you know, take great confidence from the way in which, through kind of, you know, both globalization and the access to stories that you know these big streaming platforms have offered audiences who've mostly consumed those stories over the course of the last year because they haven't had other ways to engage with um, performance and storytelling like the theatre um, that, that that can embolden us to reevaluate you know what we think of as as being popular uh, and ca capturing the imagination of our audiences mm. and actually picking up on a on the earlier uh, question about the touring um, companies uh, there's a question, do you foresee any changes around touring which might help contribute to a rethinking of theater's environmental impact as we all start moving around again? Um, so uh, can I say something about that? Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give an example. I spoke, I interviewed Mar um, Maria Orberg who has actually almost sort of, there's got an, there's an irony here. She set up a theatre company, she's a director, um, uh, originally it was of Swedish heritage, but of course has been working in Britain and elsewhere in Europe for a very long time as a director. She set up a theatre company, uh, which is going to tour a lot, which whose sort of central conceit and mission is Europe and European theatre. Now, there's the pandemic to think about the future of touring, and then there's Brexit to think around about touring, because you know, much of the income of theatre, UK touring companies is dependent on, on European tours, which will actually have, to, so there's not just one thing going on around the pandemic, there, there's more than one, because th there's all sorts of new policies coming into place around touring and about Europe, around Europe. So, so touring companies, and Maria Orberg said something very interesting to me, because I said, well, how are you going to make this happen? Because, you know, already, the national, you know, has, has put limits on UK tours and, and various other companies are, have been put off because of, because of the various requirements around, around touring in Europe. And she said, well, there's more than one way to tour and uh, there's a physical way to tour, and, but we don't have to be because, of course, now we've encountered another way to do it uh, and to have that sort of exchange with European companies. So we have 
Zoom, we have online facility. Uh, we've had, we've shown that we can invent around these things. Of course, I don't think tours can just be done on Zoom um, or online, but, but that helps. So it doesn't mean that touring will die because Brexit has happened or that the pandemic is stopping us from traveling as much. I think from the perspective of audiences as well, that there's a kind of sense of um, hyper-localism that's emerged a little out of the last year and that certainly speaking on my own behalf, I've got to know my neighbors better than ever before. I've really kind of felt more connected to my town center and to the kind of ethos of my community. And, and I think because inevitably it's likely that in the weeks and months ahead, audiences are going to be reluctant to travel that does need to be a key opportunity for um, regional theatres, you, you know, theatres rooted in their communities to really find ways to connect with audiences that might have previously travelled further afield in order to, you know, see theatre, certainly in a town like Northampton that is close to London, Milton Keynes, Nottingham, Leicester and many other bigger cities, that's something we're really hoping to embrace because we, we really hope that that kind of sense of, um, you know, a bit more remote working, a bit less commuting, uh, a little less traveling uh, is a wonderful opportunity for kind of speaking directly to our, our local audiences. Mm -hmm. um, it is worth um, saying, I'm so sorry, my internet cut out earlier and so I missed the beginning of the discussion about touring, but, but if it wasn't mentioned, um, it's worth saying that for most regional producing theatres, 60 to 70 percent of their income does come from touring work and even the most active producing theatres that produce a huge volume of work throughout the course of uh, a year rely very very heavily upon um, touring work to kind of build their business model and so it, it is absolutely essential to kind of reigniting the sector to create a really healthy um, touring uh, ecology and, and ultimately touring work is always going to reach parts of the country and communities that uh, other work won't um, just because ultimately we have seen in the last 20 years a decline in the number of producing theatres um, and um, a, a real kind of shift in focus um, a, a, away from the risks that a lot of venues can take on in terms of uh, creating their own work so the touring ecology is going to be at the heart I think of our regeneration. Do you think the way we tour will be um, investigated, you know, we'll, we, we, there'll be a lot of questions about how sustainable the old model of sticking, um, as I've said, pieces of wood on the back of a lorry really is. Um, I think there will be, it's not going to happen overnight, but there will be a shift, not to digital theatre, but to using digital resources so that the, you know, there will be a set to some extent mm -hmm. that, you know, walks around the, 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 the country on a USB stick. Um, we, we, there will be 3D printing where we create pieces of work, pieces of set in every venue because it's a lot cheaper than, than, than rebuilding it and more sustainable um, and taking it around um, the country. I think the way that, in, you know, companies tour um, might well shift. We might start going back to that whole putting everybody on a train thing rather than everybody driving. Uh, you know, there's a there's a, an awful lot. And every venue, we're, we're you know we're under the cost to do this, but we're all choosing to look at the, the decisions we make on a you know really micro level on a day to day basis to be more sustainable. So this is great. We've got um, I've just got two final questions. We have time for because I'm packing two in, we'll have to have very brief answers, but I couldn't resist because they're such great questions. One is for Aretha. How do you think theater criticism is changing or might change in response to the pandemic? And the, the last one is for the rest of the panel, which is, um, will you have a welcome back submissions window or will you focus on a no doubt huge backlog or will you perhaps be looking at a bit of both? So starting with Aretha and then getting to that other question. I think theatre criticism will be a little different in its nuance and texture. I think I've, personally speaking, I have a lot of compassion. I have a lot of insight now in a way of some of the financial aspects of theatre that 
I didn't need to have as a critic, but I am now armed with that. I can't unlearn it. And I'm not saying that will make my critics, that will compromise me in ways that I'll be too kind and lose uh, uh, that critical integrity that I need to have, quite frankly, to be able to do the job well. But I will go in with kindness um, in, because I, I know I've had a year of learning what the theatre and talking to, to, to in the industry about and the nuance of, of the touring world of the regional theatre, uh, uh, you know, not just London. And so I'll, I'll be armed with that. I still think I think I need to judge theatre now, like in, in the way not, not uh, I need to understand that we've we're in the we've just come out of a pandemic and sort of still one leg in it, but that it's not doing it's not servicing anyone to um, d mislead the reader, you know, and misread the uh, mislead the audience that's going to pay a ticket in our new straightened world where people have less money in general. Um, people will be will have uh, will need to be taught you know will will want to be guided by the critic about with star ratings and with honesty but I think I will be um, so I so I won't be sort of being dishonest or over generous but I'll be kind and I have insight in a way that I didn't have and I think critics in general I've talked to others and we we know what we have to do and we know that there's going to be great excitement in being a critic and just sitting there and writing those first few reviews in the first few months. And there's going to be great joy. There's just going to be, you know, star ratings based on the fact that you're there having this, uh, you know, elate, this joyous experience. Um, but it will be business as usual in terms of critical judgment with that kindness brought in and insight. Yeah, that's sort of uh, real knowledge, as you say, of what goes into uh, the production and uh, the challenges. Um, this, thank you. And the, the last question was uh, for really in terms of that backlog versus new submissions idea. Um, James, do you want to start? Uh, yes, I mean, inevitably, um, th there is a backlog. But I think, um, as we've touched upon really uh, throughout the afternoon, that it's about people rather than it is about productions in that obviously we feel a very strong commitment to honoring um uh, you, you know the commitments we hold to a lot of artists whose work we were going to produce in the last year and we will go on to produce that work but in almost every instance those artists have rethought and rewritten and redesigned their productions to ensure that they continue to feel relevant in 21 or 22 or 23 when they're produced and again a kind of key word I think of the afternoon has been agility in that we've learned to be a lot more flexible a lot more reactive and to turn around uh, commissions and development processes much quicker both because of the kind of digital tools that we've had at our disposal, but also because there's been such an incentive, I think, within the sector to respond to the world as it changes around us. And so the balance we're trying to strike is one of honouring the commitments that we hold to artists, producers, partners, and so on, but also to carve out the space to be reactive and to be agile and to be open-minded and to you know, really reinforce that as we do open um, our venue again, that we do so with an open door. Did you want to add to that from your perspective? Um, I, I couldn't add to anything that James has said, really. I mean, we, you know, we'll be looking for new voices and actively doing so. Uh, and uh, every, one of the things that have happened during the last year is that our artist development programmes, um, you know, nationwide, but at the Oxford Playhouse in particular, uh, have really been busy and found a lot of new participants and some really exciting work. So we've got to find a way of making the realizing that work, whether it's being an, a main stage production is a different matter. But you know, there's there's a, a lot we can do with it. Yeah, I think the be... last word, Ellie. <laughs> well, not necessarily the last word, um, but I, I actually think it'll, in, in many senses, it'll be a Venn diagram between the old and the new with a sort of coalescing in the middle. So that's the lessons learned, but also uh, the, the sort of retaining what was joyful in the past and what was important. Um, and in terms of new submissions, like, well, 
send them in like you know it might take a bit of time for us to get to them um but uh yeah no always always wanting to read new stuff definitely venn diagram <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes yeah i'm just so pleased with um bringing it to this joyful close it, it, it that is the word that came up most along with agility and invention and challenges um but what a terrific discussion and thank you to all the panelists um, it, it, this does bring us to the end of this webinar, but please take a moment uh, to respond to our feedback survey, which will appear in your browser when the webinar ends. The next event in the series is on the 20th of May, and it's called It'll Never Work on Zoom, and it will explore the highs and lows of online participatory theater workshops. You can register using the link in the ch chat, excuse me, and we'll be wrapping up the whole series on June 10th with a conversation about the future of theater and the place of digital within that. And I feel what a great um, start we've made already in, uh, in that area. So please come back and join us for the, the remainder of that um, and new directions we might ponder. So thank you again, and we will sign off now. Thank you to Torch above all. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Thank, thank you. Absolutely. Lovely to see you all.